Good. So uh, it's 12.01. And uh, despite people are still coming in into the call, we will start um, the seminar. Uh, welcome, uh, warm welcome, everyone, to this researcher's desk lunch seminar. And a special welcome to uh, Sasha Beslik, uh, who is our guest today. Uh, my name is Svetlana Gross. I will be um, moderating this uh, seminar to the best of my uh, abilities. Um, there is a, a slight uh, risk that I will be asking too many questions because um, I am myself a PhD student in um, uh, the same area that uh, Sasha is working with, namely sustainable investing and uh, my special um, interest in how uh, the financial sector is uh, tackling the climate change issues um, and working or not working with the uh, the kind of challenges that we face um, and uh, Sasha can be maybe um, presented as one of the main uh, and vocal actors and uh, personalities in the Swedish uh, sustainable investing scene and uh, you have been working with these issues for you were one of maybe one of the first bankers who started working with the sustainability and social sustainability issues among other things um, so it's, it's great to, to, to see the, the really big interest that uh, the seminar has gathered and people continue to, to come in. Um, we have had a couple of uh, seminars already with the topic or topics related to the economic system and all of them were very popular and uh, people had lots of questions. Um, so all your questions will be very welcome. And just before um, I hand the word to Sasha. Uh, I would just like to say uh, a couple of household householding things. Uh, Sasha will be talking for maybe about 20 minutes, uh, as, as long as he uh, wants. Um, and then um, during that time, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat. And please uh, indicate if you want to ask your questions yourselves or if you want me to read them, because sometimes people don't, don't feel comfortable turning on the camera and, and so on. So you're welcome to indicate that. Otherwise, um, you're also welcome to raise your hand um, in the end and sort of we, we will have it as, as an interactive discussion uh, in the end. Um, so with that said, um, very welcome, Sasha, and uh, you have uh, the time to present, uh, to talk to us about your um, experiences and uh, about your view of the current sustainable investing situation. And yes, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you said earlier, I've been working with this for 20 plus years. I started uh, when about 2003, when uh, responsible ethical investment was regarded as a hippie type of view on the world, especially in the financial industry. Uh, at the time, we were lacking uh, both the tools, the information, and maybe most of everything, we were lacking courage in the investment industry to address some of these issues. In the beginning, it was all about uh, ethical and moral issues, pretty much related to some of the sectors that are regarded as uh, the knights of apocalypse, so alcohol, weapons, tobacco, and stuff like that. Um, over the years, this has evolved, and you know, I was going back in 20 years of time, uh, I was... Uh, part of developing this, what is today uh, a big industry called ESG type of sustainable investments, especially in the Nordic region. Um, I worked uh, for big banks and private banks and big banks, both in, in Sweden and Switzerland. And now I work for a big pension company in Denmark. A um, um, couple of sort of a takeaways from my time uh, over the last 20 years, uh, just to position the financial industry as the core element of the transition towards more sustainable future, one of the key takeaways for me back in 2003, and prior to that, I used to work for big oil companies around the world. So, and I worked with the social and environmental issues as a specialist on what was called the social and environmental impact assessment in Africa and former Soviet Union countries, uh, uh, was the fact that financial toolbox, the global financial toolbox that we are using today, and have been using for a number of years, uh, has a purpose to uh, allocate capital uh, flows where uh, they are mostly needed, 
and where they can create uh, the most effect uh, for the owners of the capital. Um, as a financial toolbox, as a part of the economic system, financial industry has tremendous impact both through investments and lending in how we can contribute to create this sustainable transition that everybody's talking about. Uh, over the years, uh, a number of, of tools and, and approaches have been developed uh, in the financial industry, on the margins of the financial industry, not in a very core, in the center of it. And I will come back to that because most of the, the core elements of, of the purpose of the financial industry, including fiduciary duty of the banks and asset managers and institutional investors has not been changed. It's still the same, which is to generate returns as much returns as possible, uh, as short as period of time to uh, least risk as possible as defined by uh, owners, uh, which in many cases has nothing to do with sustainability, climate change, or anything that is related to what is in our world regarded as externality uh, when we invest and manage money. So out of these 20 years of working with this and basically fighting the same fight every single day for the 20 years uh, by trying to influence and change the way how we make investment decision, um, I've come to the conclusion that sustainable transition as we envisage that transition, as discussed at COP XXX, uh, as discussed by politician is going to be very hard if we don't change underlying financial system and the rules that financial industry is deploying to address uh, externalities in the way how this industry is allocating capital going forward. Uh, so if you look at it from a perspective of practitioner, which I am, and I've developed you know, investment products, I've done analysis, I've developed analysis models, I've developed products, I've developed uh, the ways how we engage with the companies, I've done you know, uh, all kinds of things that you can imagine uh, in the space of sustainable investments. But the core conclusion, which is becoming more and more obvious, uh, and if we look at some of the facts today, is that approximately 10% of the capital around the world, the 10% of the world's wealth is today uh, invested uh, accord in accordance to some of these ESG criteria that I use to determine how companies are sustainable or not, 10%, which means that the 90% of the capital in the world today is invested without any strings, any, any strings attached in terms of uh, paying attention to externalities, the impact that capital makes on the local societies and people involved on the climate and so on. And the core reason for that is that if you look at the world from sustainable in investment point of view, most of the capital that is that is invested and managed in this way comes from European Union. And uh, most of the capital uh, in the biggest economy in the world, being the United States of America, is not invested in this way. So capital flows that are still very much needed in this transition are not invested in accordance to any rules and regulations, although some of these things are emerging on the surface. In Europe, you have European Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation called SFDR, uh, which is pretty much linked to the taxonomy, U taxonomy that apparently, as it looks right now, has completely failed and utterly failed to provide some kind of a guidance for the industry to be able to allocate capital for what is sustainable and what is not. Uh, that being basically um, reflected in the way that European Union, due to the interpolitical dynamics between most likely France and, and Germany has resulted in a fact that nuclear energy has uh, is being proposed to be regarded as sustainable and a gas, natural gas is supposed to be uh, regarded as sustainable. What this mean, it means in practice is that of course, uh, investors uh, and politicians are counting on private investors going into the small module nuclear plants all over the world in order to address climate change and all of that. So there is a significant risk that interpretation that will be done by the industry in terms of what is sustainable or not uh, is going to be much wider than it was expected before, which allows a lot interpretation and interpretation in our industry means that we can do pretty much as we did, we have done before. So 
to to summarize the challenges, uh, I take three key points, and I think it's important to to discuss these points. The first is that <clears throat> financial capital flows do not reflect <clears throat> at all in their construction, in the time horizon, in the risk premium that is calculated in, uh, is not reflecting the situation we are in at all. Uh, the short terminism of, of our economic system, which is pretty much reflected and supported by financial industry, uh, is creating a way of what I call the quasi solutions uh, to, to tackle some of these big challenges that we are facing. Uh, electric vehicles being one, uh, I can touch upon that later on, uh, and is creating a diversion from discussion that we need to have uh, in a much broader sense on uh, what is the role and purpose of financial sector, but also what are the the tools that we really need to use to create systemic changes uh, in the societies we live in. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the corporate sector, uh, despite the, all the marketing things, the, despite the, the tremendous greenwashing that is going on right now, the spend the, uh, the, uh, despite the adverts in uh, Swedish newspapers and international media about electrical vehicles being net zero neutral, all the net zero commitments, uh, the underlying mechanisms that are driving corporations, which are specified in what is called corporate acts, uh, in Swedish, it's called Aktie Bolagslagen, have not been changed last 75 years. So it means that you as a CEO or a senior manager in a company that operates under that legal framework, in principle, can interpret your role and responsibility, your fiduciary duty, only in relation to your stakeholders, not in relation, in relation to your shareholders, not in relation to your stakeholders. So the underlying structure that is supporting this transition is not there. We are marginally trying to change some product offerings we have, but in a sense, we are not changing the way how these corporates are organized and what kind of a targets they have in terms of shifting their business models. That's sort of a number two. <clears throat> and I touched upon the solutions earlier. So <clears throat> electrical vehicles is a very interesting example um, because it's almost like a um, hysterical focus on addressing the underlying systemic issues that we have in, in our economic system, which is up to 70% still dependent on fossil fuel production uh, with, uh, I call it a, Western wealthy world solution that all of us have still right to have our own car and we can replace bad conscious of driving a diesel or petrol car with an electrical vehicle car, knowing, and this is something that people do know, uh, and most of the people buying electrical vehicles have also enough intelligence knowledge to understand uh, what, where are the materials coming from and how important it is that uh, we have a more of a long-term solution to, uh, to transportation challenges related to CO2 emissions than the short ones. 70% of, of cobalt that is used in all kinds of electrical vehicles come from DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that I visited about six times over the last six years. And uh, it's produced in a way that I don't think any uh, person in our part of the world would regard as either responsible, sustainable, or even healthy from that perspective. Uh, what is interesting in the investment point of view is that you have to understand one thing. Investments in uh, mines, producers of minerals that are necessary for the transition to sustainable future, are in, our, in my world uh, regarded as not sustainable. So there is no ESG sustainable investments made in these mines and companies that operate in these mines. However, there is a rush to invest in Teslas and other electrical vehicle producers. So the input material is not sustainable, but the end product is sustainable. That gives you a bit of a feeling sort of where we are. The third problem is, or the fourth one, um, I'll outline that and I'll stop talking soon. Uh, and then we can go and get on to the question is that the current way of us uh, 
integrating externalities in our investment decision-making processes is very much obstructed by the fact that we don't have uh, a true price of the cost of some of these externalities that companies are causing. And being that CO2 emissions, because we don't have a global price, we don't even have enough data to look at the uh, biodiversity or impact of the com that companies and company products have on, for instance, various aspects of biodiversity. So, and the data we have access to is backwards looking. It, it's usually one year late to us because the companies are producing their CR reports and uh, we have to look at the backwards, backwards looking information. And most of that information is not certified. So it means if you go back in history that, you know, if you read the BP CSR report before Macondo accident, everything was fine. All the risk management practices and principles were there. If you look at the Volkswagen CSR report uh, before Dieselgate, all of that was fine. So there is a disconnect a bit between the information we have access to and information and investment decisions we need to make. So a lot of it, a lot of it out there in the market is a hot air. Uh, there is a big discussion that is going on in my industry in, uh, in terms of the greenwashing, what it is, why, why, why is it so hard? Uh, and this recent regulation in the European Union with taxonomy is not helping us to, to be better because it's going to leave a lot of space for interpretation. And as I said earlier, uh, that's most likely not good, uh, which points me in the direction of regulation, which is something that in the financial industry is not really... You know, interested in because we don't like regulation. We think regulation is preventing us from from making the deals we want to make. Uh, so, if you put this all together, of course, there are a number of solutions to this. We can come uh, we can come to that maybe later in this conversation. But the core sort of a message is that one, financial industry as it is constructed today, with incentive models that we have today, it's not contributing to sustainable transition at all. Uh, number two. Uh, we cannot change the underlying economic systems without changing the legal frameworks that support companies to do things that are not good for us. And number three, solutions we provide that we develop right now need to be systemic, not symbolic. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Sasha. And uh, um, I mean, I can only... Um agree with your um, conclusions. But I guess um, we can discuss the question, what, so what, and what next, right? Yep. Uh, because um, it, um, it is quite, I mean, it's quite obvious that uh, if we have 90% of the funds uh, invested without any restrictions, and the 10% of the funds invested with something that uh, most people in the industry actually don't really believe in so much. Um, and the rest of it, uh, say, what is credible and what is uh, um, more or less uh, making a difference, it's, it's a fraction of things. Um, so in that sense, um, the question is maybe coming back to what you started with, to um, raise the question of the function and the role of the financial system in the whole economy. And by the economy today, we need to, to mean democracy as well, because there's a very close connection between the two. Um, so what, what do you think um, is um, a more correct way of describing uh, the role of the financial system? Is it as uh, the economic theory has it that um, it's an intermediary that passes the funds between those who have uh, free free funds to those who need them or does it have more power in in our lives you know it, it depends on i think there are two elements of this that you're addressing that are interesting the, the first is that the financial purpose of the financial toolbox and financial system is to support the the the, the real economy in its development, being that sustainable or any kind of development, and not to have a purpose to enrich itself, which is the fact what is financial system doing right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed, not so impressed, disappointed, but almost as scared, 
with the fact that people have forgot 2008 and what financial industry engineering has created in terms of the you know, negative consequences, all the populism that we see, all the polarization in the world that has you know, affected so many economies around the world. And what has happened is that, I mean, the public sector has saved the financial industries in big parts of the world, including the US. And there is so little talk about this. And it's so little understanding and really truly analysis what this means in practice. And also what are the interactions between the economic system and the financial industry right now and also what they need to be in the future. So what scares me is the this almost like a <clears throat> unreal narrative that is dominating the media in both in Nordics and in other countries is that getting people to, you know, uh, fly less, eat less meat, uh, recycle, buy electrical vehicle and all of these things. And in the same time, while they do that, uh, all of the investments and all of their pension savings and all of the kids driving license money, all of that is invested in a completely different direction. So what is the point? And I think what, what scares me is also the fact that uh, politicians that are in many countries in Sweden, they are quite educated, at least to some extent, uh, they don't see the connection between these two things. Uh, themselves, I mean, you have environmental ministers that, that in, in, in Swedish context had investments, they, they, they are drafting the new laws to protect the forests, and in the same way they're investing in the companies that are de de depleting them. So there is this lack of consistency, and I think people need to understand the role of the financial industry and also what it means in practice. In practice, it means that if financial industry does not shift financial flows, and what I mean by that, this is a term, we stop investing in what is not sustainable and we start investing in what is sustainable, there will be no sustainable transition. It's very sort of a clear message. And we can have a marginal discussion. We can have uh, um, you know, a lot of uh, new green steel factories, but that in, in itself will not solve the problem we have. And that's something that discussion is not even present today. We don't even discuss this. It's, it's not there. It's like uh, if you go to somebody today, any of the big banks or asset managers, everything they do is sustainable. You know, if you look at the principles for responsible investments, there are trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars signed to these six principles, but the emissions are still increasing. So the question is, you know, what the hell are we doing? I mean, uh, why, why don't we, why can't we talk about the elephant in the room? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, I'm guessing that um, the taxonomy um, is supposed to be telling you, telling the investors and telling the companies, the corporates, uh, what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. But then the process of how we get into the taxonomy is de designed and it's organized in a way that, um, again, that is um, not helping us in that sense, uh, but we can we can continue on that. Um, we have there, a there, there, there's yeah. one, only one thing, just so, uh, so everybody that is not sort of a technically nerdy in terms of the taxonomy defines only one aspect, uh, which is a climate related aspect, not social issues, not nothing else, because they cannot agree on anything. Uh, so it's it's just trying to define one fraction of of definition that even on that level, they cannot agree what it is. So it needs to be sort of a taking into the consideration. Yeah. Yeah, so we, let's let's take a few questions. And uh, I think Alistair was first um, and asking a simple question. Would ecocide law be a solution or a part of the solution? Yeah, I mean, look, you can have an ecocide law, but if, if, you, compare, if you have an ecocide law and then you have a corporate uh, charters of the companies that do, do not include any responsibility for externalities, there, there is no sort of a, what are you going to, what are you going to sort of a sue them for? Because do you, you're going to sue them for what they already, they're supposed to do. They do what they're supposed to do because that's stipulated in the corporate charters. So if we don't change the corporate charters, I mean, ecocide law, yes, it's good to have, but you know, they will go to the courts and they say, this is what we sign on to and this is what we're doing. So, you know, I don't know. It could be a symbolically very important thing, but I don't know. Hmm. Uh, Eric, uh, who's uh, you raising a hand? So you're welcome to talk. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Sasha, for a great talk uh, as usual. 
uh, I'm wondering how do you compensate for lousy business model like fast fashion, fast furniture, fast food, fast whatever? You do a lot of marketing. You do a lot of marketing, and you can convince... marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you Thanks. do a lot of. You do a lot of marketing and you uh, you convince your clients that uh, when they buy and purchase your merchandise, they are really contributing to the better world. Uh, look, I mean, this fast fashion thing is a nail in my brain. I'm thinking about it every day. And uh, I've been trying to address this issue for, I think, over 10 years. And unfortunately, I'm losing that game. And I'm losing it for the fact that people in general... Uh, have difficulties to, uh, and maybe not even the willingness, time to understand what they're actually doing with this. Because the fast fashion and fast furniture and all, all of these things that neoliberal sort of a thinking has placed as the core solution for our problems is just in the long term depleting us from so many good things. And I'm, I'm, I'm so... Uh, I'm so disappointed that companies like, you know, H&M and companies in, in, a, in, a, in a different segments of this economic system that we are in, that are very much based on their business model is based on growth and volumes and cheap labor, are the ones that are succeeding. And this is, uh, I mean, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy when you understand that, because the, when you look at the numbers and you look at the numbers that some of these companies are claiming sustainability credentials and they don't pay, pay living wages. It's like, you know, I've been to these factories. I've been in all of the fast fashion industries from Ethiopia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, China. I've visited all of these places. I mean, it's bad and it's really bad and it's bad that people don't care. Sasha. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, um, to that, uh, we have a second question to the, to the same um, point and uh, from Folke. Uh, how do you regard the US state's attempts to introduce legislation concerning supply chains, as for example, the New York Fashion Act or the corresponding Californian attempts? I've, I've seen it. I think it's very good. It's a good start. I've seen it. I, I actually, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good starting point. Uh, that will imply that many of these fast fashion companies <laughs> will just need to shut down their businesses. So now, depending on how strong lobby organizations they have in these countries, and I assume they do, uh, it's going to be uh, a probably the interesting process to follow. But if that happens for real, uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, so good for so many million women that work in that industry. Hmm. And and just a uh, follow up um, in in the same uh, to the same uh, point. Um, say H and M, if uh, they suddenly decide uh, tomorrow to start paying living wages um, to on, on the factories that they are subcontracting, what would happen to the stocks uh, on on the stock exchange? Yeah, they're gonna get, they're gonna get punished. Because the industry, and this is this is exactly this is exactly the point that people need to understand. Mm -hmm. So they will get punished because the role of the HM is to maximize revenues back to uh, shareholders of the company, that being a family, uh, HM family, person family, and all the other investors that are investing in them. So the increased cost on paying the living wages, they can take out two ways. Either they can take down the shareholder. Uh, uh, revenues that can get, get back to revenues or did they can increase their prices but when I had many years ago I had this discussion with H&M and they, they were you know they're not even willing to talk to me anymore because I'm so obnoxious in a way how I approach this is that if they increase and I did the calculation I think that I did that like five or six years ago if they increase the price with five Swedish crowns to five cents uh, on some of their merchandise, they could pay a living wages, but they are competing on the global market. And the business model they have is basically based on two things, volumes and cheap labor. That's it. If you take the cheap labor out, then the business model looks completely different. Yeah, thanks. That was my point, kind of. Um, uh, let's uh, let us let's, uh, me, Monica, ask uh, the question, and then we will go into the um chat questions because there's lots of good questions there well i'd like to comment on this question of ecocide law uh, we're not talking about the 
model, the business model and the laws for business, we're talking about a superordinate law on the level of genocide and crimes against humanity. You can't say, well, I'm just doing it for business profit, even though it happens to kill lots and lots of people. Could we have, could we have a private conversation about this? I'd really like to talk to you about this. Yeah, but look, we, we, can, we, we, we can have a conversation, but ju just, I mean, you have to think, maybe I'm a bit destroyed because I lived in this corporate world for so long time. It's, you have to think about one thing. It's like, I've been giving a role. I have a, I have a business description of what I'm supposed to do. And that, that goes back to, I was a CEO for investment funds. I had a senior functions before. So I have my contract. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm responsible for doing certain things, which are stipulated in a way how the corporate uh, charters looks like. You want to sue me for uh, destroying the planet or destroying a river and sue me, but where in my contract, where in my roles and responsibilities uh, is the river or biodiversity or climate? Nowhere. So uh, you're free to charge me, that's fine. But the question is, will it lead to any change? And that is the reason I'm saying is that we need to look at the corporate charters. That is the discussion that we need to have. And nobody wants to have that discussion. I had a panel in this country, in Sweden, for about two months ago, and I had two big representatives, three big representatives from financial institutions on the stage with me. I was asking, do we need to change a corporate law charter or not? And none of them provided me the answer because that's, answer, that's the discussion you don't want to have. Because that means that we go into the roots, roles and responsibilities of the capitalistic system, of the companies and the financial industry. And that is the discussion that is not present, is not addressed at COP, is not addressed with politicians. Ask in Sweden, you can ask the financial uh, prime minister of Sweden. She was a financial markets, oh, fi financial minister. Let's ask her, Magdalena Andersson, do you think that we should change the corporate charter of the companies in Sweden to include uh, things like climate uh, responsibility for climate issues, responsibility for living wages, biodiversity. Uh, that one is hard to see. Okay. I'd still like to have that talk. The ICGN has come out in favor of international criminal law against ecocide. So, I, and I don't, I'm not disagreeing with your, temp, your, your idea that corp, the, the charter needs to change, you know, the, the law. I, I'm not disagreeing. I just think yeah. we need to add something to the equation. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Th I agree. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, of course, it's an important question, but I guess, um, um, yeah, I, it is uh, slightly different levels and the implementation of the law is something that's really discussed uh, a lot. But we do have um, um, a really lots of good questions in the chat. And um, I'm afraid this will not be possible to sort of go through all of them. But uh, starting from the top, Carlos, would you like to uh, would you like to ask this question yourself? You can read it if you. Okay, uh, because there are also some related questions. Um, like from your standpoint and your knowledge, how much of this has to do with the persona itself, meaning that we have many leaders that dare to change their inner values, inner ethics, and therefore the. Is, is there a reflection and therefore to have a reflection on our system? And some other questions are also addressing the role of what can I do as an activist to influence that and how much, um, for example, really good um, point from, from uh, Jorg on, does this mean all this, what we're talking about, does this mean that we need to change the economic system at the root? Uh, which means transforming our society because it's so interconnected. Uh, that would need a new story and who is interested in telling the new story and who's, yeah. in, who's interested in listening to that story. I mean, look, in, in, it's, it's, it's a bit sort of a, we need a new narrative, but we also need to build that narrative. And that narrative starts with a discussion and a dialogue about where we are. And also a discussion about the role of the system that we are operating right now, is it serving the purpose? Is it serving the purpose of most of the people on this planet? The answer to that question is no. During the corona, what is it? 1% of uh, the most rich people in the US have become 400 times richer and 160 million people have been uh, homeless. 
I mean, and th that goes probably for many other places around the world. So, and that discussion, I mean, the news came out uh, on CNN, report has been done, released in Davos, and uh, two days later, it's something else. So there is no public discussion about this. And the narrative we have, how we can change this. I tell you one thing, and that goes back to, to you, Svetlana, in, in the schools and education institutions. We are still educating millions and millions of people every day uh, based on the economic theories and practices that are outdated because the facing, they're going to face reality that looks completely different. So I have this experience of... a. Uh, um, um, recruiting young, young financial analysts that we need to program in two years, reprogram them, uh, get, get another type of set of values, get another type of, of view on the life and, and uh, on what is important to be able to do the work that we needed to do to look at the sustainability angle. So educational system is very important. We need to sort of reform that. Uh, we need to start having a public discussion about the underlying narratives that are basically controlling even the narratives that we think are helping us are a bit sort of a control by various interests uh, around the world they are not true in a sense so and and changing the culture perspective you know uh, i remember the and this hurts me the most is the fact that most of the sustainable investment industry uh, and ESG industry is very Anglo-Saxon in the view. It's, it has a very sort of a traditional Anglo-Saxon view on what the solutions are. We don't care what solutions may be much more practical and pragmatic in India. We, don't, we punish a lot of Asian companies because they have a bad governance. And you know, the bad governance in Asian companies is that you have the board member that has been on the board for 12 years. That's long term, man. That's somebody that has taken its responsibility for a very, very long time. And you can pin that person down responsible for things that happened 12 years ago. In our world, it's seen as a no good thing because we have a very Western view of looking what is right, what is wrong, how, do we, how are we going to call, uh, uh, solve the sustainability transition? Yes, we have all the answers. We're going to solve it exactly as we think it's good, good without taking into account the other perspectives, other cultures, other experiences, all of these other things. And that debate is not even existing. And what's, what scares me the most is that we are running. We think that this narrative has provided ah, electrical vehicles. We're going to electrify everything. We're going to be carbon neutral. Who cares? Because it's not underlying system is not changing. So it's about the same thing. Um, so as to the alternatives and as to the sort of um, things that actually exist in parallel to the um, traditional interpretation of fiduciary duty and so on, uh, we have a couple of questions as well on these things from Rebecca, yeah. for example. Um, what is your opinion of the B corporation structure? Does this fly as an alternative corporate structure? Is it Danone, for example, um, providing a, an example of this uh, working? And also a related, um, a related point on uh, sort of other alternative corporate forms, such as foundations, for instance, and for, or, or what um, Jennifer Hinton is, is uh, writing about as well, the non-profit, non-for-profit uh, forms. Sort of how do these alternative forms, uh, what role can they play and how can we promote those? I think the new forms, corporate forms and organizations structures to organize the, 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 the sort of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, institutions or companies, it's very important. I think the B Corps, it's predominantly uh, sort of interesting, I mean, visible in the US. There are certain companies that I've seen that they become B Corps certified. Uh, they then operate under the other tax rules and stuff like that, which is to some extent good if it's used in a, for the right purposes. I think it, in, in European Union, uh, that is very, uh, if I understand, I mean, I've come across some, but not many. It's very limited amount. It's not that popular at all. I think it has to do with the fact that in European Union, you still have a lot of, at least on a paper, uh, you know, make uh, make up looking like representation of the unions on the on the boards and union representatives and so on, which is not the same case in the U.S. So, 
you know, it is good. We, we're going to see the new forms growing up, a public private type of companies, uh, uh, all of it, or everything we can do to, to increase the level of um, um, responsibility of the actions of corporates uh, in regards to the sustainability and climate change and climate transition will be very good. So I'm very positive to that. Hmm. And as to responsibility, there is a, um, a comment from uh, David in, in the chat. Um, and I mean, it's it relates to the narrative uh, in the um, sustainable finance kind of industry. Uh, I saw you in an advertisement for Nordea in which you were flying over tar sands fields in Canada. You argued that Nordea should keep the investments in the tar sands companies. Can you please expand your thoughts on this? <laughs> did I That's argue? If I did I argue for that? I don't remember. I, I don't recall that I did that, and I don't work for Nordea anymore, so I, I'm not going to make any statements for Nordea. But uh, the general, I did, and this was back in 2009 or 10. Uh, I didn't uh, say that they should invest, but I so I basically envisage that this tar sand uh, extraction in Canada at the time. Uh, given the pro oil price will probably most likely be, become very profitable. And the way to do it is to go and try to uh, uh, influence and engage companies. And you should also recall that I was the only investor ever that visited uh, the uh, North Dakota uh, pipeline uh, on minus 30 degrees and got all of these companies uh, divested from Odia back in the day. So um, I did some of the uh, some of the hardcores and many of these things, but this is this is related to Nordea. I have nothing to do with it anymore, so no comment on that. But I guess um, I would probably um, phrase it in a different way because today um, the mainstream understanding of uh, not least the pension actors uh, is that we do not uh, because there's been a lot of. Um, um, yeah, a lot of uh, focus on divestments and Sweden has become slightly like um, extreme focus on divesting pension funds, for example. Um, but the m mainstream actors today are saying, well, no, divestment is, is just um, the, the play oh, for, for the yeah. galleries, but we need to engage. Uh, we need to transform the basic industries. We need to transform the energy sector. And the only way to do this is to engage with the companies. Uh, meaning uh, high extractive companies and, and so on. Yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, look, I mean, um, engagement is used as an excuse to not do much. And in most of the cases, you as an outsider uh, would have difficulties to understand uh, any results achieved by these engagements. Engagements are making difference when you see that when you bite, when you don't bark. So you need to be able to bite. Uh, and companies know exactly what it means. I did one thing, which I, one of the few things that I'm very proud of, I did engage a number of Indian pharmaceutical producers uh, and I was um, uh, captured and taken to Indian prison. I spent about uh, two days in Indian prison because I was smuggling out the water samples from, from the rivers. At the time I was working for, uh, for Nodia and uh, uh, after a couple of years, we actually managed to force the Indian pharmaceutical industry to uh, install water treatment plants together with the big uh, pharma companies around the world. And the only reason we managed to do that is the fact when I filmed all of this pollution, I sent, when I came back home to Sweden, I sent a video link with a, with, a, with a password and a short letter to 30 CEOs of the biggest pharmaceutical industry companies in the world. And I tell you, that film was not really nice. And usually you get the answer maybe in six months or, the, uh, or a year. I got answers from all of them within a week. Uh, so there is a way how you can do it, but you cannot do it from a desk in Stockholm. You cannot do it from a desk in London. You cannot do it from a desk in New York. Investors need to be hand on, hands on. So when somebody tells you we are engaging, then you ask them, so what is the result? What are results? Are these company being better? Are they performing better? Uh, can you show me exactly what, what they have improved and so on? Because the problem with the engagement is it's used pretty much as the excuse of postponing the, the decision or postponing the, the challenge some, to somewhere else. And people don't take it personally. I mean, you know, somebody else will take over in three years time and they will say the same story. So that's how it works. 
Um, yes, but despite that, um, it's it's the kind of uh, mainstream um, preferred mainstream is um, yes, yes, it, strategy. Um, yes, so it is just one thing. It is because they are not challenged. They are not challenged for it. They say we engage, and what, what are you going to do? They to, and, set, and then, they're, they're going to set the net zero targets. Yeah, they're going to set net zero targets, but these net zero that twenty fifty. I mean, come on. It's like 2050, uh, it, we might be go around it, but who's going to evaluate? Who's going to hold them accountable? I mean, it's like, it's, that's a long way. And they are so, it's so pleasant. You know, I meet so many CEOs, so many senior executives in, in the financial industry. 2050, my friend, that's a long, <laughs> I'm not going to be around. So that's not a problem. It, it, it probably, hopefully we will be around 2050, but um, to that uh, point, we really don't have so much time left is, is, is a pity, but I really would like to um, to talk, uh, would like to hear you talk about that. Um, I think um, what I heard in, in the end of your uh, talk is that there's a problem of um, data. There's a problem of information, yeah. Yeah. The data that investors have to take into the investment decisions. Um, but um, on the sort of large scheme of things, um, uh, what data is lacking? We do know that climate change is happening. We do know that this is the burning of fossil fuels. We do know that the mines in DRC are a bad place to work. We know that living wage is something that is necessary for people to survive and so on. So um, this is a, 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 alongside with engagement, the perfection of data um, for analysis is also something that is on everybody's lips, uh, which to me doesn't really, it's, it's kind of also sounds a bit like an excuse to yeah. not to not do things. Like how, how do you see that? Look on data, data is not verified. So in principle, it's like this. Uh, I'm a company, I'm running a company. Uh, I provide the data to a third party. In this case, in our case, in our industry case, it's MSCI or Sustainalytics or whoever. They then put that data together and they sell that data to a bank or asset manager on the other side. Uh, that data is collected by algorithms that MSCI has. It has the analyst assigned to it, but they're actually not analyzing it. They are more putting it together. And that data is then provided to me and then I need to make investment decisions based on that. None of the data that we get access to is third party verified, which means that if you don't have resources, if you're a small company, small asset manager, or if you really want to do these things and you don't have, you can't pay hundred thousand dollars for a contract with MSCI, uh, you you rely on something that is really sort of a, you know fair value of the uh, that companies are sort of presenting to you, and knowing from history that that's no, not always the case, you end up in a situation where you sort of uh, need to spend a lot of time to understand how numbers have been cooked. Uh, people are using, companies are using um, uh, carbon intensity inst instead of carbon footprint, and then they're using carbon footprint later on. So it's very difficult, you know, you need to spend a lot of time and spend a lot of analysis and, and manpower resources to get this, to, to understand that. So I think the future of ESG data and C CR, CSR reporting, CSRD, uh, all these new things are coming up. It's all about the third party verification and certification of the data that, that we can use and really trust that this is the case because that's not what it is today. Um, so, you know, that's going to be a new business line that will go up uh, in, in, in a sort of in the water after the, you know, financial industry is pushing, companies need to respond. At some point, it's going to be so big push that the, the, the industry will tell to the companies, hey, guys, we need this third party certified because we actually hold accountable for this. So it's going to be a new thing coming up. Hmm. So you, you do believe in, in better data and certified I, I, data? I think that it's going to be new data coming up. I think it's going to take time. The industry is going to push. The more we are pushed, I mean, that's basically how it looks. The, 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 the public sector, the politicians are arm wrestling the financial industry saying that we cannot make the corporate sector listen to us too much because, and you can do that because you have the financial capital, you invest in them. So, so the more they push us, the more we will push the companies. That's basically the rules of the engagement. Okay. Uh, so uh, to sort of uh, summarize it, uh, we'll just read the, what Jennifer Neal has, has um, noted in the, in the comments. Um, 
am I right in understanding your message here, Sasha, that engagement from our part should really be holding companies to account and to ask the really important questions from which they cannot hide? Yeah, but look, I'll give you an example. And this is, this is the exercise everybody on this call can do. So go four, four years back and download four latest H&M CSR reports. Just do it and compare the numbers over time. I mean, it's very simple. They, they give you nothing because you won't be able to understand the thing. The contextual understanding of the data is very important. So the thing is that they engage, 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 but the, there's only one question for IKEA, which is not stock listed, for H&M, for uh, Zara and all of these other in the in the text group that is owning them. There's one, one, one question. When are you going to pay living wages? That's it. There's no other questions. There's only one question. Instead of telling me that uh, six percent of all the clothes that we sell in our factory, in in our uh, off, in our stores, comes from recycled polyester, it's like sure, that's very important. Yeah, and and for and for um, paying living wage, you don't really need perfect data, I guess. But there's um, there also questions. Um, um to that uh, point uh do you have advice for non-experts on how to invest their money uh for example the pension savings and i know the answer you do you have a book about that um, mm -hmm. which you haven't mentioned yet <laughs> you, you need to buy no i'm just joking uh well the book is good it's in english and in swedish you can use it if you want but i think what what, what the most important thing is that you know whatever bank you have wherever whatever product they sell you uh, and they do, um, you should always ask about the results. So what are the results? So what do, what do, I, what do I, my money really in real terms contribute to? So the problem with the sustainability investments right now is that when you buy something that is tangible, so you buy, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, um, recycled things, being clothes, stuff, doesn't matter it's tangible you can see it but when you buy sustainable investment products what they tell you what they sell you is the process this is how we select the companies this is how we assess them and da, 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 da. this is how we engage them what you need to ask about is the result so i invest this amount of money and then this is um, i have chosen ecobank and it works perfect with a free visa card that's perfect ecobank is a fantastic just go ahead with that um Good uh, recommendation. I also have my money in Ecobanken. Um, so last question, which we really have two minutes for, but which is um, engaging with, for most of us, I guess. Um, what is your view on net zero? Uh, because I've also seen that um, your uh, current workplace with a Danish uh, pensions company is going to um, offer some sort of climate neutral products uh, quite soon. So climate neutral uh, implies net zero. So what is your position? So sort of, what is your view on, on net zero? Uh, net zero what? Emissions. The, the emissions. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult to have a net zero emissions when you have 60, 70% of the economy dependent on fossil fuel. So it has to be reframed into discussion that is ongoing in industry right now. Uh, so regarding my new employee, this is not, I'm not doing this on the behalf of my new employee, I'm doing it on behalf of my, myself. Uh, that's the discussion, that's the question you can ask the press department, that will be fantastic. Uh, and then we can come back to you in a more official terms. Uh, net zero, well, you know, it's, it's, there are so many, there are so few ways to get there. And the reason what, what concerns me a lot, I did when I was in Switzerland, I was there for two years. I did a big analysis on 6,000 companies and what business trajectory and climate their business models are. Out of 6,000, we identified 172 companies today that are on uh, that kind of a trajectory. That means that there are very few companies that are, they, they are there. So you cannot, in your investment thinking, your universe gets from 6,000 to 172. So risk in your portfolios goes up. So you cannot invest in that. So there are very few tools you can use to achieve net zero. The only one you can use, it's a forest. So forest investments, forest compensation and all of that. And that, that, that is what I think the industry will do for, for most likely for, for a number of years. Yeah, thank you. And yes, we have, have had um, other discussions about forests and quite a lot of those. Uh, but I've been told um, that I need to leave a few minutes for Alistair. 
yeah. in the end of the talk. Uh, so I thank you so much, Sasha. And if you have uh, a chance, have a look at the chat and maybe because there was questions about the, the trade agreements, for instance, the, the role the trade agreements can play and how they um, can be changed in order to facilitate what we're talking about. Uh, and also the taxonomy question. Uh, so, yeah, but you, you've said before the taxonomy is probably going to be a big failure, but um, yeah, so if you uh, feel like answering some of the questions in the chat, you're most welcome to do that. Um, and so thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, give a great big thanks for we can Anytime you want, we can do it again. And uh, there's a lot of nitty gritty details to discuss, but uh, this was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha. That was totally brilliant. Thanks. Bye.